Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give a brief, just a very brief history of the relationship between Iran and the United States, uh, starting from like 1953 until now, um, because I think sometimes people don't really have a historical reference, particularly Americans. We only look at the 1979 um, Iran hostage crisis, and we have no other frame of reference as to why our relationship is the way it is with Iran. So I'm going to start there. Uh, then I'm going to get into very current events within the last couple months, uh, and then talk about my two peace delegations that I went to Iran last year. Um, I have a lot of pictures, a lot of video, you know, to kind of show you um, some of the things that I got to observe and experience. Uh, and then at the end of the presentation, um, just provide ways that people could do things to try to stop a war with Iran and try to, um, you know, change our relationship with them. Okay, so that's the game plan. Um, so the history between Iran and the United States, again, starting in 1953. Um, at that time, um, there was a lot of uh, relationships between oil with Britain and the United States and Iran. Um, Britain was, I guess, really, um, I guess, uh, from the Iranian perspective, taking up, you know, too much oil or not really um, ex sharing the cost in the way that it should have been shared because this was, you know, on Iranian soil. Um, at that time, they had just elected, democratically elected, uh, Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, uh, and he really wanted to kind of take back Britain's control of the oil on Iranian soil. Uh, and wanted to nationalize oil, you know, and kick <laughs> Britain out. Uh, this is where BP came from, you know, from the oil um, relationship here. So that's what he did um, to help the Iranian people to nationalize the oil industry um, because, again, the United States and Britain particularly, you know, had our hands involved and was making it so it was not fruitful for um, the Iranian economy. Well, that upset Britain and, um, you know, the United States. Um, and there was a CIA coup uh, of their government in 1953, okay? Um, that's when the Shah came into power, um, which was backed by uh, the U.S., and a lot of people felt, okay, he really reflected the U.S.'s interest, um, you know, in Iran, uh, and he took power. Um, many people didn't like him, you know, uh, he was a very brutal leader, uh, a monarchy. Some people did like him, um, but this is what led up to 1979. Um, when students, uh, originally it started off as, I guess, it was going to be a peaceful demonstration or protest, but they overtook the U.S. Embassy, taking 52 uh, Americans hostage for 444 days, okay? So that's where Trump gets this <laughs> idea of 52 sites in Iran uh, to potentially look at as targets. He got it from that number, okay, the 52 hostages that were taken. But again, a lot of um, Americans only look at that not realizing hey, we actually overthrew their government, uh, and actually, you know, they were, um, you know, having on the fledgling of having a democracy. Okay, this is a really good book that kind of talks about this, I'd recommend. It's called All the Shah's Men, An American Coup and the Roots of Middle East Terror by Stephen Kinzer. Okay, really good, kind of gives the background of that coup and things leading up to 1979, so I'd definitely recommend that. Uh, another book I'd recommend, this is a really quick read, um, it's called Inside Iran, The Real History and Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran by Medea Benjamin, who is the co-founder of the organization Code Pink that I traveled to Iran with on these delegations. Um, she actually founded Code Pink in 2003 after um, the invasion of Iraq. So it was, that kind of led them to develop uh, the organization Code Pink, which is a women initiated NGO out of DC, you know, an anti-war organization. So th those are some, things, some books I would recommend. So because of what happened in 1979, we severed relations, relationships with Iran and put sanctions against them for the last 40 years in one form or another. Other big things have happened since then. Um, the 1980 to 88 um, Iran-Iraq war, which um, initially, uh, the U.S. gave weapons to both sides, to Iran and to Iraq, uh, but in 1983, they really kind of favored Iraq, and they supplied Saddam Hussein with intelligence and chemical warfare that he used not just against Iran, but even his own people. Okay, so we had a, a big hand in that as well. And later in the presentations, we met with veterans from the Iran-Iraq war, 
and I'll talk more about you know, their experiences and their injuries because of that. In uh, 1983, there was a marine bombing in Beirut um, where, um, in Lebanon, that killed 241 U.S. service personnel. Uh, the bombing was traced to an Iran-affiliated militia group, Hezbollah. You know, so that's something else that certainly strained our relationship with Iran. Uh, in 1985, the Iran-Contra affair, um, you know, that's where, you know, when Reagan was in office, and, you know, we really had a policy, you know, we don't negotiate, you know, for people to being taken hostage. But at that time, they decided to, you know, basically an arms for hostage thing. Hey, we'll sell you arms if we can get back some of our hostages, which, again, didn't, was not great for PR. Okay, so that's another thing that happened. And Oliver North, all that kind of stuff, which you might remember. Um, this is a really big one in the memory of people in Iran. This was kind of like their 9-11. In uh, July 3rd, 1988, um, a U.S. Navy ship in the Persian Gulf accidentally shot down um, a commercial airline, Iran Air Flight 655, killing all 290 people on board, civilians. Uh, again, they supposedly mistaken it for a fighter jet or something like that. <laughs> something very similar of what happened more recently. So for and Iran never, quote unquote, sought revenge for this, uh, you know, the way things are happening. Um, but this was like something that was very, very devastating to them. And at that time, the first George Bush, I think he was vice president at that time, he had said, you know, I don't care if it's a mistake or no, I don't care what the facts are. The United States will never apologize for this. So the, the United States government has never formally apologized to Iran for shooting down the airliner, okay? Um, skipping ahead here to 2015, when Obama was elected, or when Obama was in office, um, his administration uh, negotiated the Iran nuclear deal, uh, which is called the JCPOA, um, that is the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, um, which would allow, uh, part of this deal was Iran would roll back development of their nuclear program in exchange for lifting of some sanctions. Okay, the United States, Iran, China, France, the UK, and Germany were all signed on to this agreement. Okay, it took um, about 20 months on and off of negotiations between the United States and Iran, where, you know, John Kerry met with um, the foreign minister, Javad's um, Zarif, which I'll talk about later, which I got to meet when we were in Iran. Okay, so you know that was a huge, huge deal, and I'm at least I'm going to talk more about that later. The perception in Iran. 2017, when Trump came into office, he withdrew the United States from this deal um, and imposed more sanctions on Iran. Okay, <laughs> this year, uh, if you've been paying attention to the news, um, Trump ordered uh, Commander. Qasem Soleimani's assassination. He is considered the second most important leader in Iran. Okay, so Iran is a theocracy, so they have you know religious leaders and a president you know uh, that run the government together. But really, the religious leader, the Ayatollah, has more power than the president. There makes the final say. So it's the Ayatollah and then uh, Commander Soleimani who. Um, was the commander of the Quds Force, which is an elite force of the Revolutionary Guard. You know, they're a military. They, uh, we, uh, our government assassinated him. And for many people in Iran, and not just in Iran, in that region, they looked at him as a hero for helping to defeat ISIS, essentially. Okay? Not everyone in the region likes him. There are some Iranians that thought he was terrible and brutal and things like that. But even if they didn't like him, Killing him, you know, has really is going to have very long-standing effects, you know, as far as our relationship and things in the region. Okay, um, and then a few days later, Iran retaliated with missile strikes to uh, U.S. bases in Iraq, which fortunately there were no casualties. There were people that were injured that are actually coming back with concussions and brain injuries, um, but fortunately no one, no one died. But that happened very recently, uh, and then. Just a couple hours after that happened, uh, Iran accidentally um, shoots down the Ukrainian flight uh, 752, uh, which again harkens back to what happened 
um, but just on our side in 1988 when we took down their flight. Um, but again, many people feel like, okay, they were kind of on edge here because they just shot missiles to our bases and they're expecting retaliation. Okay, so that's kind of where we are now. Okay. So this is your trigger warning, all right? So since I've been to Iran, I've been in contact with people in Iran on almost a daily basis since, you know, the first time I went last year. Um, the day that the missiles were, um, the, the eighth, was the eighth for them is the seventh for us because they're eight and a half hours ahead. Um, one of my friends was giving, providing video in the WhatsApp chat, um, you know, some stuff that was not on our, our media, <laughs> and I still can't find these videos in our media. Uh, our media is pretty sanitized compared to other places in the world. So we sent these two um, video clips of, you know, the missiles being shot there. So that's what I'm going to show you now, okay, if this works, inshallah. <laughs> so that's one of them. Here's another one. another one to show you too. Now as I'm getting these videos and a bunch of Americans, we're all in this group chat together, um, my heart was literally like going to bust out of my chest, okay? Uh, it was terrifying. Here's one where actually you hear American soldiers in the background. Anyone hurt? Oh God. Oh God. Hey, hey. In the past. Lord help us get out of here, all right? Come on, come on. <laughs> everyone, everyone okay so far? Oh shit. It's fucking done yet, Hey. Help us get out of here, all right? Please, Lord. Let's all be okay. Let's all go home safely, Lord. Yeah. Holy shit! Hey, chill, chill. Lord, please let it stop. Please let it stop. Oh, shit. Oh, God, don't let the next one be any closer. Just let him stop, Lord. So, yeah, you can see how terrifying that is from that perspective on that evening. Like I said, luckily no one died. Um, this, I think, is a really interesting map um, showing... <laughs> the 45 U.S. bases surrounding Iran. You know, we talk about who's really the aggressor here, but who has their, whose bases are completely surrounding Iran, okay? Um, and you can see, you know, Iraq's parliament recently voted for all of the U.S. military personnel to leave their country, and we said, no, we're not leaving, and we sent more people. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's not really helping relationships either, but that's currently what's going on. Okay, so the reason I went, the reasons we went on our two delegations to Iran last year with Code Pink, which I mentioned before is a women initiated anti war NGO. Um, well, first off, we wanted to learn about the impact of US sanctions on the Iranian people, how is it affecting them, um, and the impact of withdrawing from the nuclear deal, and you know, ways, and this would lead to hopefully ways we can come back let American people know what's really going on there and try to influence our government. 
Um, we wanted to see the impacts of the travel ban on people, um, visit historical and cultural sites, and just really form people to people connections. You know, it's really a you know, a, you know, a person to person um, type of thing so we can make those relationships. This is a picture up here of us meeting with the foreign minister, Javad Zarif. Uh, this is just some students that came up. Anyone that saw us, you know, realized we were Americans, like they were super friendly. You know, the people wanted to talk with us, get pictures taken with us. Um, you know, they were super sweet, super friendly. Um, you know, they loved the American people. They may not less necessarily love our government or their government, but they were extremely hospitable to us. Um, and I've been to several countries in the Middle East, and, and generally people are very hospitable to Americans. But Iran, to me, you know, they felt the most hospitable, and actually it felt like the safest country that I've been to in the Middle East, to be completely honest. So February of last year, February 25th, uh, we met with the foreign minister. Again, he's the one that worked on uh, the Iran nuclear deal. And, you know, he had said at that time when that had gone through, uh, Iranians were very optimistic, okay? Um, you know, very optimistic at that time. Um, they, nowadays, <laughs> maybe, and this was in February, so the number's probably much lower now, 50% uh, of Iranians believe that they should remain in the nuclear deal. Um, when they first signed the agreement, over 80% believed it would make a difference. Now, 80% believe it won't make a difference, <laughs> and 51% believe that we sh they should stay in the nuclear deal. Again, that was back in February. A lot's probably changed opinion-wise since then, but this is what the foreign minister told us. Uh, he met with our group for 90 minutes. Uh, you know, we, we went into the building. We didn't have to go through any security. Okay, they trusted us. We went in. We met with him. Um, he actually was educated from high school through his PhD in the United States. Um, so he's very familiar with the American educational system and the way that we think, as well as the Iranian system. Um, he said, you know, Americans are much more analytical, um, where Iranians are much more historically focused. So for us, we're like, oh, you know, what happened in 1980 or 1988? Well, that's so far ago. For them, that is very recent, okay? They have thousands of years history. Um, so that, for them, is a, is a very recent history, okay? Um, something else that he said, I have some quotes here. If anyone wants a copy of his, or I can give you the website link later, of uh, a transcript of our meeting with him, I can, I can give that to you. But this is something very interesting I thought he said. He told our delegation, the U.S. difficulty with Iran is not because of the region, not because of human rights, not because of weapons, not because of the nuclear issue. It's just because we decided to be independent. That's it. That's our biggest crime. Iranians are resilient people who resist the arbitrary actions of the Trump administration in dumping the nuclear agreement and intimidating European partners from honoring their commitments of the agreement to loosening sanctions. Okay, so, you know, that's something that he, and he reminded us um, of our relationship with Saudi Arabia, who certainly has human rights abuses. Um, you know, they, uh, they assassinated um, Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post uh, Saudi Arabian dissident reporter, um, you know, crimes in Yemen, you know, you know, concern about how women are treated and many brutal things, but we are very, very chummy with them. So we, we say we care about our human rights, but do we really, you know, looking at who we're allied with? Okay, so that was something that he brought up in the meeting too, and, and several people that we met with would, would bring this up, you know, the kind of the hypocrisy of it. Uh, but that's our picture there as well. Uh, we also um, had a press conference at the University of Tehran um, where there was a panel of people, including uh, this professor who teaches um, U.S. relations. He also, I believe, got one of his degrees and or taught in the U.S. His name's uh, Fouad Azidi. Uh, he's regularly on different news shows, you know, talking about the relationships between Iran and the U.S. Um, he... Um, they talked about concern, or students there expressed concerns uh, about the travel ban and, again, wanting to come to the United States and being unable to. Um, also, it was basically PH PhD students that were there, and most of the college students in Iran are actually women. I think it's like 60% or something like that, so they have many women that are being educated. Um, some other effects of U.S. sanctions is the inability to get English books there. You know, Amazon won't ship there. You can't mail anything to Iran. Because of the sanctions, there can be no money exchange between our countries. 
Um, we could not use credit cards over there. I had to bring a lot, a lot of cash <laughs> because that's how we had to uh, buy things. Um, so, you know, he teaches, you know, in the World Relations Department, particularly with relationship with the United States, and he can't cook English books. Um, so, you know, Code Pink organized a Books Not Bombs kind of a book drive to uh, collect money to get books. I personally contacted some publishers who donated some books. Now it's just a matter of getting them there, okay? Um, but for their library, you know, the need for those books that they can't access. Uh, we also visited a couple schools. Um, this is the first time I went. We visited a school that was for street children. Um, these are children that, you know, come from families that are very poor or maybe their parents are addicted to drugs. Uh, where they would, you know, sell things on the street to try to make money. Forty percent of the children at the school were Afghani refugees. Um, they, yeah, they were um, Afghani refugees. Um, the students were very excited to see us. They were very happy. Um, some of them were, you know, spoke some English and were very articulate. This one little girl here is interviewing um, one of our delegates. And she had some pretty deep philosophical questions, you know, like, you know, um, how does our school make you feel or what makes you happy? Um, uh, you know, she had some really interesting things to ask her. I was really impressed. Um, this other um, picture, they have this thing set up, a kind of a TV for shy students where they can kind of put themselves in the frame and then that might make them more comfortable to speak. Okay, so that's what uh, is in that picture. Um, there's a lot of contradictions in Iran. So, you know, drugs, alcohol, all of this stuff is illegal, but they have a major issue with drugs because of the opium coming in from Afghanistan. So there are serious, serious addiction issues there. Um, they, you know, if you drink alcohol, you can get, you know, um, <laughs> hit many times or um, for that. Um, but they actually have 12-step groups there. So that's something you wouldn't expect. Uh, another interesting contradiction, um, you know, Iran is known for not being great about gay rights, okay? However, the government will pay if you want to get uh, transgender surgery <laughs> because they consider that like, okay, that's a defect or a medical issue, something's wrong that needs to be fixed, so they'll pay for that. So again, there's a lot of contradictions, things you don't expect. Um, about women, there's compulsory hijab. You'll see in all my pictures there, as a woman, when I'm out in public, you know, I had to wear a uh, hijab. But it could be very loose, very stylish, you know, but you do have to cover up. Uh, but compared to some other countries in the region, um, the way women are treated or some of the rights women have are a little bit different. You know, women can drive cars. Like I told you, most people in college are women. There's women lawyers. We met with members of parliament. Many um, women were there. Okay, um, so you know, there's yeah, it's, there's a lot of lot of contradictions you know within this society and things that you would not expect. I told you we went to the Tehran Museum of Peace, which is led by veterans from the Iran Iraq War. I mentioned before that the U.S. supplied Saddam Hussein with intelligence and chemical warfare. Um, we had some uh, tour guides that um, led us around. And they had long stand. You know, this this war ended in 1988. They still have long standing injuries. The director of the museum, he lost his legs in the war, so he's in a wheelchair. Um, but two of the other men, one because of the um, mustard gas, his lungs have been affected permanently, where he's constantly coughing. Uh, another gentleman, and he'll have in this video that I'm going to share with you, uh, talks about. Um, I believe he's talking about the the effects of his. The, tear, the mustard gas on his eyes and being unable to get medications because of the U.S. sanctions, so he has to cut an onion to help his eyes water. Okay. So I have a video from this. Extensing my lungs for helping with breathing. And because of the damage to my eyes, I have to do the cornea and the Right now we have uh, Seventy thousand people uh, that are uh, their treatment is ongoing after the war right now. خب اینجا شما دارید می‌بینید اثرات که عامل خردر رو چشم و یه و پوست داره که نمونه اینش رو آقای سلیمی رو دیدیم. 
as my colleague explained before, you can see the side effects of a uh, mustard uh, agent, uh, as you can see on the society and me. Well, I forgot to tell you, um, this is a little picture when we were at the school one of the children drew um, and gave us. So if you want to see, I have a lot of show and tell things here. Iranian money, if you want to see it. Copies of Tehran Times in English. Okay. Oh. Oh, so while we were there, I, I told you before about the Iran air flight that the U.S. Navy shot down in 1988 and the U.S. never formally apologized for. Well, one of the, um, our delegates, her name's Barbara, she was wonderful. She came up with the idea as an apology on our part, on the delegation. At this time, there's 28 Americans we went. She created this beautiful book that had the names of all the, the 290 people who died on the flight written in Farsi. She included poetry in there because Iranians love poetry. They have a rich history with poets. Um, and we all, signed, um, we all signed personally notes. And we presented it to the Museum of Peace. And I have a video of that, too, of us presenting this. Peace uh, with Iran. <laughs> And we're all very committed to try to stop our government's uh, malignment and threats toward uh, the country of Iran. <laughs> and one of the things that uh, we haven't uh, uh, acknowledged is the fact that the family was, as uh, Stephen mentioned, uh, very complicit in the, uh, the war between Iraq and Iran, but also a very tragic incident that happened with the American military Navy ship shooting down one of the civilian airliners. And on coming here, we thought of perhaps giving a, a memory and an apology from the United States to the people of Iran for that. And Barbara Briggs Letson, a great artist, has created a wonderful book that she would like to present. And perhaps you could tell them about the names of the so there are many ways to apologize, and one is through creativity. <laughs> so I would like to read to you the beginning of this book, our, our group statement. We come from or to Iran from the United States of, <coughs> of America as a people-to-people -people peace delegation. <laughs> With the hope that peace, friendship, and mutual respect will soon be a reality between our two countries. And that this relationship will continue far into the future. From our hearts, we offer our sincere apology. And express great remorse for the attack by the U.S. Vincennes on Iran Air Flight 655. <laughs> In which 289 persons died. We have not forgotten your pain, suffering, and loss. May peace flourish between the Iranian and American peoples. And may we together, for the future of humanity, 
resolve to end war and militarism. و این امید که بتونیم در کنار همدیگه برای آینده بشریت پایانی برای جنگ و نظامی گری داشته باشیم. So the names of the 289 people who were killed in the air flight are here. اسامی تمام کسانی که تو این پرواز کشته شدن رو اینجا تک تک با خطاطی نوشتن. And then knowing that the Iranian people very much appreciate poetry. There is a little bit of poetry in here. <laughs> and the members of the delegation have written personal notes to the people of Iran. <laughs> so we hope that in this museum you will keep this and that the people of Iran will accept our apology and we will continue as friends. امیدواریم که شما این رو در این موزه نگه داریم و این رو به عنوان یک روز خواهی بپذیریم و این روز به مردم ایران هم بتونید انتباه بگیرید So after this ended, it was quite emotional. Um, there was a Quaker on our delegation from New Jersey. He um, led us all in uh, some Quaker peace song that I don't know, you might, but we all held hands and you know did that. Uh, and then the gentleman, uh, the director who's sitting there, they you know embraced. It was a very warm embrace. And then um, the director had said to us, I hope in the future that you come back to Iran in friendship and not to ha have to apologize on behalf of your government. Mm -hmm. So it, it was it was very emotional <laughs> um, after that. I thought this was really really interesting. One of the things that the museum from the Syracuse cultural workers <laughs> was a make art not art not war of a bumper sticker. That was kind of funny to see that there. Um, would they also took us to um, one of their largest cemeteries in Tehran um, that have the martyrs from the uh, from the Iran-Iraq War, um, so we got to go there and pay our respects. Um, here is inside uh, one of the mosques. This one, this is very emotional. This one woman came up to us, and she was a, a mother in tears. She said she had, you know, lost her son in the war, and she had been coming almost every day for about 20 years <laughs> to the cemetery to visit uh, his grave. So that was that was really sad as well. Um, we did have dinner with some prominent Iranian uh, women. Uh, we met with a gold medalist in kickboxing. That's this woman right here. Um, the sanctions affect her because much of her boxing money is made outside of Iran, and she's not allowed to create a checking account to actually bring money over to Iran. I personally, and <laughs> just to see the effects of sanctions, I have witnessed personally this week, and an Iranian student that I met, a PhD student up at Cornell, I, I talked to him about it. Um, so I'll tell his story first. He told me that he's from a small village in Iran that's quite poor. Maybe only 3,000 people live in this village. They very recently got a library, and he was trying to fundraise money to get books for this library for the children. So he started on Facebook um, uh, an, uh, a fundraiser, and he had a, a GoFundMe page. Well, because it was for Iran, or it's mentioned for Iran, both Facebook and GoFundMe um, blocked his account. It would not allow him to collect money. Then people were like, oh, use Venmo. Same thing, his Venmo account got blocked. Okay, myself, I'm in this, this um, Facebook group um, you know, about tourism to Iran, and since November, since the protest happened in November in Iran till right now, tourism is really being affected in Iran. It was already not great anyway, because <laughs> a lot of people are not necessarily going there, but it was impacted even worse because now people from many countries uh, don't want to go to Iran or are scared because of conflict, so they're losing money that way. So one of the ways that some of these, tourists can, uh, these tourism groups can make money is they have a book um, that shows um, many Iranians living and what their life is like, um, what their life is like, and they're like, listen, we're trying to sell this book to earn some money since now we're losing tourists. You know, people are canceling their tours. But, the, um, <coughs> but if you have a U.S. credit card, you can't buy this book because um, I tried it with my card and I got blocked instantly. They're like, okay, send us an email to this. One. Okay, you can PayPal us here. Do not put, I, or don't even mention Iran in the title. You know, we'll have someone from Germany mail you this book, blah, blah. Like there's this whole workaround you have to do because of the sanctions. Nothing 
monetarily can be exchanged relating to Iran between our countries. Um, we also met the wife and daughter of nuclear scientists who were killed by the Mossad, which is the, you know, kind of, uh, um, does everyone know what the Mossad is? The uh, it was really um, kind of forces there. Um, and those are just some names of some actresses that we met as well. And there's us with the women here. Can you briefly say what the Mossad is? Um, the Mossad is like, um, I guess, the Israeli version of, would you say, our CIA? CIA. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like the CIA. Intelligence services. Yeah, yeah. So, um, just some of the addi additional effects of U.S. sanctions on Iran. Another thing we had the not good fortune to uh, have happen to us, on the very first day of our delegation, this gentleman, He's a peace activist from, I believe, the San Francisco area. His name's David Hartsock. And I have some copies of the articles that he wrote if anyone wants to take it. He started to experience chest pains on the first day we were there. So we're like, okay, we have to get him to the hospital. They're like, um, you need an angioplasty and you need a stent. You know, you are potentially going to have a heart attack if we don't do this now. And it would be unsafe for you to travel back on a plane because you could risk run the risk of having a heart attack on the plane. Holy crap. So... But because of the effects of the U.S. sanctions, his insurance company refused to pay. He was on the phone for them for three days. They refused to pay for his treatment there because of the U.S. sanctions. Again, can't, can't um, exchange money. Luckily, some nice women at the Swiss embassy, that's the cloak because we have no embassy there anymore. Um, that's the closest we have, were nice enough to loan him the money to pay for his surgery that he had to pay back when he got back in the United States. And this was his, um, one of his doctors. Uh, he got to talk to people, because he was in the hospital the entire week we were there. So he got to see, I mean, luckily, most people don't have the Swiss embassy there to help them out as Iranians, okay? A lot of people die because they don't get the needed medicine and treatment um, that's necessary. Even though the sanctions are not supposed to affect food and medicine, it does, because a lot of countries are afraid to do any business with Iran because they're afraid of what the U.S. might do to them, okay? So I've had, you know, a good friend there. His, his mother has cancer. Many months she could not get her chemo medicine. He also had um, someone in his family who was in his 30s died of lymphoma, which is very treatable, also because he couldn't get medicine. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things. They have really outdated kidney dialysis machines that are really painful for people that they have to use, you know, these old outdated equipment. Another thing, uh, moving on, um, so, because of the sanctions, their air, their their um, their planes, the Boeing planes, cannot get parts. Okay, because these are U.S. parts, they cannot get parts to fix their planes. And we had to take a flight from Shiraz to Tehran on Iran Air. And I know this, and I was nervous the whole time. I'm like, please, plane, do not break down, or hopefully there's no problems. Because I know because of the sanctions, you can't fix this plane. Okay, so I was a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. Okay, so that's another way uh, U.S. sanctions impacts them. Um, some other ways in sanctions impact them, as people told us, um, people are holding off getting married because, you know, they can't, they can't afford to get married, they can't afford a car, sometimes they can't even afford appliances like a refrigerator, just things that they need just to get through um, their, you know, their um, lives. I don't want to be all doom and gloom, so I have included some very nice cultural things and uh, music. Um, this is one of my favorite places we visited. This is the Esfahan Music Museum, where you got to see all these really cool instruments. And then at the end, um, you get a performance uh, from these um, very talented musicians. And I'll play you uh, a bit of that.
I kept in touch with these two um, musicians after I left. This is a Santor, what he's playing. He actually makes these by hand, okay? Um, so when I came back, I came back. I tried to bring little gifts for people that I thought I might see again from the first time. I just bought little bags. So I had like a postcard from Ithaca and like a ch chocolate bar, my favorite chocolate bar, just little bags. They were so excited. They it's like, let me take pictures of this. It's just a chocolate bar. But, you know, I told chocolate is a nice gift that they like to receive. So I, I brought them and, and got to see them again. This is the second time I went back um, and took pictures with them there. Uh, this is um, a square, the Noxiji Jahan Square. I'm probably really mispronouncing that. Also called Imam Square. It used to be called Shah Square in the Shah time. And some people might still call it that. Um, this is the largest, this is a UNESCO site, um, the largest square, I believe, in the world after Tiananmen Square in China. Okay, a lot of people hang out here. There's beautiful mosques. People come here at night. It's beautiful. I have some video from that to show you as well. This is, um, you know, the fountain. This is a picture of what it looks like at night, and I think this is a video. Hold on. Hanging out there. These are just more pictures at night of the square. This is um, the bazaar, uh, and just another picture just showing you the, um, you know, beautiful architecture of um, the mosque. Uh, also on the square is this carpet shop, and actually I bought a couple carpets there this last time I went. And I'm going to show you a video of him describing um, the ways that the carpet is made and designed. Mm -hmm. From the right side is the name of the city Isfahan, mm -hmm. and then the name of the weaver. All the shining co uh, colors, which is in the middle, which is mostly white color, is our silk. Mm -hmm. Rest is lamb's wool. The base of Isfahan, also this part, is silk. This is around three years work for one person. Mm -hmm. This is another picture from the square. Another picture. Uh, we also got to see Persepolis, um, uh, you know, up close. Um, it was quite a ways dif a dif uh, distance from Tehran. We went to Tehran, Esfahan, and then Fars province on our way to uh, Shiraz. Uh, we also got to go to the tomb of Hafez, which is uh, one of Iran's most beloved, famous poets. Uh, in the United States, probably the most popular Iranian poet or Persian poet is Rumi. Okay, but Hafez, his tomb, right where I'm standing, his tomb is behind there. And these are the gardens. This is another place people go. It's very romantic. People go there on dates or with their families and just hang out at night and during the day. Here's some pictures of it during the day of the gardens and, again, the, um, the tomb of Hafez behind me. Uh, I have copy. Actually, I have a copy of the... Uh, of Hafez's book. If I'll pass around if you want to see it. But they kind of, the way they use this book, it's almost like telling a fortune where you're just supposed to open up randomly on a page and then read what's there. And this is in English and Farsi translated. Um, this is in Shiraz. This is a, a mosque um, known as the Pink Mosque, is its nickname. When we met with people, again, we had these little stickers that said Peace with Iran in English and Farsi, and we would just give them to people, and particularly the kids were so excited to get these stickers. But, you know, people would take, we'd take pictures with them, and, you know, they'd be really excited. So we tried to give it to people as we met, met them. This is just one of the botanical gardens in Shiraz. Uh, this is a city view of Tehran. And I believe Tehran, their population, I believe it's larger than New York City, okay? I forget off the top of my head the number. Is it 9.1 million? Something like that. Do you know what the elevation is there? Is it very good? No, not off the top of my head, but there are <clears throat> mountains skiing. People go yeah. skiing there. When I was there in February, when we went higher up in northern Tehran, there was snow on the ground. It was just snowing a few days ago, so, you know, they get snow as well. Um, also, there's a lot of pollution there because the way, the way Tehran is situated in the mountains like that, it kind of traps the air pollution from the cars. And again, another effect of the sanctions is they're all driving these, well, not everyone, but some people are driving much older cars. They're only made in Iran. Um, I think I read some article that said they're, I don't know if they're um, 
using gas that um, some old, like lead gas or something. So that affects their air quality. And I will have friends tell me like, oh, we didn't have school for two weeks because the air pollution was so bad they canceled school. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so they're having problems like that. Um, this is just a nighttime view of the traffic in Tehran from my hotel room. I will say Tehran is very, very busy. Getting from anywhere can take a long time. I say the traffic sometimes is as bad, if not worse, than New York City. It's just another picture. This was in uh, the hotel that we stayed in the first time I was in Tehran, and this gentleman was just painting uh, in the foyer. Uh, here's another one. We went to this restaurant that a lot of, I guess, international people come to, and they had music playing. The gentleman in the back you see here on the drum, or I'm not sure what that instrument's called, um, when I was watching uh, Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown of Iran, if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. I saw that guy in his video too. I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy was in parts unknown. So he happened to be in this restaurant as well. Yes, he does. You cannot miss him. If you watch that, you can miss him. And, um, um, Nine million people in the urban more of Tehran and then 16 million in the whole metro Okay, area. that's what I thought. Thank you. This is just our food. They like to put french fries in a lot of plates, which I thought was interesting. Okay. Uh, people like food pictures, so here's just some food that I, pictures I took when we were in the marketplace. Um, another picture in the marketplace. Uh, this is my second time when I returned in October at the airport. Um, you know, when we had our guides pick us up, you know, that we had us take this picture of us in the airport, uh, and these were our guides. Um, is there anything that you notice in this picture about their dress that might be a little bit different than you'd see in the United States? Anything you notice? seen any ties. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. I'm glad that you picked that up and I'm just bringing up my story about that. So yes, the men do not wear ties. I don't know how strict they enforce it now, but it will, basically the Ayatollah forbid men from wearing ties after the 1979 Islamic Revolution because they see it as a sign of um, you know the West, okay, and Western imperialism and corruption. Um, and I'm just going to read a little bit um, from here. Yeah, um, neckties and bow ties were seen as to be decadent, un-Islamic, and viewed as symbols of the cross and the oppressive West. And Iranians were told to wear standard Islamic garments designed to remove ethnic and class distinctions reflected in clothing. Um, so wearing ties there is really frowned upon. Occasionally people might wear them, and if they are, they're doing it as a sign of respect if they're in a certain circumstance, I assume, or maybe with Westerners. But in general, you will not see men wear ties there you know, because of that. Um, also this last time I went, we went to, we visited the oldest synagogue in Tehran. Um, and this is a picture of uh, the book in Farsi and in Hebrew. Okay, um, this was interesting. We had to. They told us. I think they told us since 1979, we were the first, either group of foreigners or Americaners or both, that have actually visited the synagogue, um, and we had to go through five levels of permission to even be able to visit. You know, and you have to get permission for everything there, particularly as Americans. Um, if you're American, British, or Canadian, because there's no diplomatic relationships or embassies there, you can't just travel freely, like, you're, like if you're from Europe or Australia or something like that. Um, you have to be part of a tour, and your itinerary has to be approved, um, and they check in to see what you're doing at all times. You know, if something happens to us, the U.S. government is not coming for us, and there's no relationship between them. So, you know, we had to get a lot of permissions, but we went there. Um, and they were very uh, welcoming and opening. I believe they were Sephardic Jews. Um, there were uh, about uh, four people in our delegation. This last time there's 12 of us, 12 Americans, and four people in our delegation were Jewish, so they were very interested uh, in 
uh, exploring the um, Jewish history in Iran. And in the Middle East, outside of Israel, Iran has the largest Jewish population. It's not large by any means. <laughs> uh, still, they are still a, mi a minority, but it's interesting to note that they have the largest amount of Jews outside of um, Israel in the Middle East, second largest. This is just another picture of the um, synagogue. And again, they did give us permission to take these pictures because we asked. Um, this is a gentleman, a group of gentlemen we found just singing and um, talking. And uh, one of the gentlemen said, I think he had a son that lives in the United States. Uh, but he's singing there briefly, so I'm just going to play this. <laughs> من که حرف بدی با تو نگفتم چرا مهر و وفا از من بریدی This was probably one of my favorite parts. So again, there's no embassy anymore. They have turned the U.S. Embassy into a museum, which they call the U.S. Den of Espionage Museum. Um, this is the first time I visited. We just happened to drive by, and we thought this was hilarious. So we were taking pictures, and the first time we wanted to visit, but we were not granted permission to visit. I think they were afraid of the PR, because the first time we visited, we had a lot of press that were either following us or they were doing interviews with us, and I think that would look really bad for us to be there. Um, and they also have outside of it, you know, this is a lot of, like, anti-American, um, you know, uh, banners and, and things like that. The second time I came back, they've actually, I think they've painted over that to remove the, the anti-American sentiment. And they did let us visit the second time I went back. This is us visiting the embassy. This is outside of the embassy. Um, this is inside of the embassy. Um, and really, it kind of felt like a time capsule. The rugs were like bluish teal rugs that were literally, when you walked on them, the squares were coming out because it's from 1970s. Uh, we saw like the old machines, like the old shredders they use, which was really interesting. Uh, we got to visit, and these are just some interesting posters that they had up. Okay, this says, if you can't read it, I'll, oh, I can barely read it. Um, it says, death to USA, Pompeo, Trump, Bolton. Death to America means death to Trump, John Bolton and Pompeo. Death to these individuals means death to American leaders. We have nothing to do with the American people. Death to America means death to you who are a bunch of individuals and the group of individuals who are running your country. And that was a phrase by, I believe, Ayatollah uh, Khomeini. That's what I'm trying to read at the bottom there, what it says. Uh, just another, some other posters that were on the wall. We also got to see um, the Crystal Room. Um, this is where they would have private meetings. Okay, uh, and again, it's made of transparent plastic, and between the two plastic plates was vacant space to prevent um, the transmission of sound, so it was soundproof, and it's clear, so that way they can see if people are spying on them. All right, so we got to see that uh, in the embassy as well. Um, this is in Esfahan. I believe this is, if not one of the largest mosques, the largest mosque, I believe, maybe in Iran. Uh, just pictures of the architecture. This was interesting. They had a gentleman sitting there asked me for your asked me your questions about Islam. I really couldn't think of a good question, uh, <laughs> but I was very curious to ask him one. But he's just sitting there waiting for you to ask any questions that you have. Um, again, people like food pictures, so this is us, you know, just eating out uh, at a couple different places. Um, this was I thought was very interesting. When we were in Esfahan at that square I told you about before. Um, this young Iranian man comes up to someone else on our delegation and asks, what is your idea about your president? I recorded it. He was very honest with what we think about our president, or at least those of us on the delegation, or him and his friends. So I'm going to show you that exchange. What's your idea about your president? J.D. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's terrible. Keep going, John. You're on video. He's terrible. He, he's just messing up everything for for us as Americans and for uh, other countries as well. Uh, definitely Iran. People of America like that? No, no. Uh, most people, I, most people I know 
and many, many people in America, uh, yeah, we don't, this, we do not like the president. We sometimes wonder, how did this happen? How did he become president? Excuse me, but I just say this. Your president look like David. <laughs> <laughs> vale. This says Arabic Saudi Arabic Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, yes. Uh -huh. Saudi Arabia look like hell. And travel this yeah, my friend is then Ben Salmon. Oh. Killer of the casualty babies of Yemen. I mm. say my friend, and after come back in your country, says he's crazy. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> you do you have a tour leader. A what? So we had to go then, but I thought that was a very, very interesting exchange. And as I told you, people kept bringing up, well, you're friends with Saudi Arabia. Why are you friends with them? And we're the enemy. So that was really interesting. Um, this is the Nature Bridge in Tehran. This is a beautiful bridge that was actually designed by a young female architect. I think she was in her 20s. A lot of people visit here. Underneath, there's actually restaurants um, that you can visit. Um, you know, we're eating in one of them there um, that a lot of people like to check out. Um, this is another famous structure um, in Iran that they're very proud of. A lot of people take pictures here. I think some of the recent protests took place here. Um, this is at the Azidi Tower. Um, this is actually a sculpture of a man taking a selfie of himself, and people like to pose with themselves taking selfies, uh, which I thought was funny. Um, this is the, um, I can barely read that, I'm probably going to mispronounce it, the C. Sopil Bridge in Esfahan, a very beautiful, um, notable bridge that people uh, like to visit as well. This is what it looks like at night. Um, this is another uh, music video that I got um, where some young men were just playing instruments and singing there. Uh, and again, a lot of young people were hanging out there at night. So I'm going to play this for you.
also got to visit uh, the Van Cathedral, which is an Armenian church in Esfahan. Um, you know, so that was really um, a beautiful church inside. There's probably a ton more pictures I could put, but for the sake of time, I only put these two, a picture from the inside uh, walls and then the outside. Just some more food pictures. This was in Shiraz at a bazaar in Shiraz. This is also Shiraz. That's in front of the I Love Shiraz um, sign there. And just some takeaways from this. You know, the Iranian people like American people. Like I said before, they might not like our government, but they do like people, us. Um, they want respect from the international community. You know, they're a sovereign nation. They, um, you know, would like to, um, you know, they want their independence. You know, they're very proud people, um, very knowledgeable about, about their own history as well as the history of U.S. interventions, much so than we're aware of all these histories. Um, the Iranian students want the opportunity to study as, at American universities. And again, if you've been paying attention to the news, um, a lot of Iranian students who have valid student visas have been um, deported uh, or stopped at the airports in the United States more recently. Even some Iranian Americans that have American citizenship <laughs> have been detained and questioned you know, at the Canadian border and things like that. So that's a real, real issue. Um, and ultimately, no one wants war. One of our tour guides told us, you know, Americans may love peace, but Iranians love peace more because they have witnessed war very recently on their soil. So they're very aware of the impacts of it. So many people died during the Iran-Iraq war. Um, you know, it, it impacted so many families. And again, that's still very real to them. Okay. Um, you know, so they definitely don't want war because it's going to impact them probably in a much severe, more severe way than it would us because it wouldn't be on U.S. soil. Um, what are some things that people can do or what's next? There's many different acts um, and bills that are kind of, you know, going through the legislative process now that people um, could look at and try to encourage um, their, their uh, representatives to support. Probably the biggest thing people can do right now is to contact senators and tell them to vote for Senator Kane's War Powers Resolution. Um, it was passed in the House, uh, and now it's going to go up for a vote for Congress. And this act would prevent Trump uh, from not taking more military actions without congressional approval, like what happened um, at, with the assassination of Commander Soleimani. Okay, this would hopefully prevent some of those things from happening. And there's many different petitions and information about what you can do at the Code Pink website if you go to codepink.org. Um, locally, I have been asked since I went on these delegations with Code Pink to organize um, as part of the International Day for Action No War with Iran that's taking place, I think, in over 150 cities worldwide this Saturday. I was asked if I would organize one in Ithaca. Um, so there's um, going to be a rally at the Ithaca Commons, um, the Bernie Milton Pavilion, 3 to 4 on Saturday, if anyone wants to come out or spread the word. All right. mm -hmm. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. And maybe you could help me with this, maybe you can't excuse mm -hmm. my ignorance. Um, but I am an Army brat, so oh. I was raised in Germany. Uh -huh. that, um, I would say I, my childhood was in Germany, then I came to the States in 2001, mm -hmm. and then I've been here, I, like, I went, and I went back to Germany, but I'm saying all that to say, mm -hmm. my parents are in Saudi Arabia right now. Wow. Uh, my dad retired from the military, they're over there on a, you know, working as a government contractor. Yeah. I have another friend that's in Iraq, working as a government contractor. Mm -hmm. So, I'm saying I'd say I'm no, I'm not a stranger to people being deployed to go fight yeah. these wars. Yeah. However, I'm a stranger and also ignorant to, like, what, how do I find out, like, what happened and why we're really over there? So, as a military child, that's one of the questions I've always had is, why are, why are there so many army bases across, overseas yes. in the first place? Yeah. And then what really happened I'm gonna take back in the picture. Middle East, Uh huh. you know, like, why do they hate? It's like I understand they fight amongst themselves, I guess, as it relates to religion and, uh -huh. and whatever. But what did we do? Like, was it because we were backing somebody, like uh -huh. backing Iraq, to help you know help Iraq yeah. fight them? Or like, but what really? What is it to why one we're over there and two why they 
why we're over there, why do they hate us so much? I know because we're quote unquote murder, murderers in their eyes, but like just what it, what is it? Okay, what so happened? I think you missed, and I'd recommend this book. You might have missed the very beginning of my mm -hmm. presentation where I give a brief history. Um, I don't, yeah, you, were you here you, for some? I saw some of oh, okay. you said like the war was like, cause I was born in 88, so the war... Well, this happened way before the 80s, so, okay. yeah, and this is... 53. Yeah, so this is a really good book to get into this. So a lot of Americans don't know, even myself, probably, I really didn't start studying this till like the last two years, because we don't hear about this in our news, we don't hear about this in most of our history classes, mm -hmm. our relationship with Iran. It really went back to 1953, where at that time, Britain and the United States were involved with the oil in Iran, you know, they have you know oil there, and we want a part of it. And um, they just had a democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, um, who were like, "Hey, you know, Britain is really overstepping their bounds here. They are giving us hardly any little bit of the um, the um, the." What's the word I'm looking for? Um, <laughs> the money made from this oil. They're being you know they're being greedy, and that. Prime Minister wanted to nationalize the oil because it's in Iran and he wanted to help his people because that's where they're getting right. it from. This is where BP came from, British mm -hmm. Petroleum, okay? So he's like, okay, Britain, we want you out. We want to nationalize the oil. That angered Britain and the United States who wanted the oil. So, you know, Britain kind of um, got us into like, hey, we need to do something. Mm -hmm. So our CIA led a coup mm -hmm. of their government in 1953. We always talk about like, Oh, their government's so oppressive, and it's a, this oppressive regime, and they need a democrat democracy. However, we see that. Okay, well, they had a democratically elected prime minister mm -hmm. that we ousted out of office with the CIA-led coup. That led the Shah to take power. Um, and it was a monarchy, and he was backed by the U.S. and had the U.S. interests uh, in mind, uh, and was you know a brutal dictator as viewed by many of the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what led to what happened in 1979 with the Iran hostage crisis uh, when students overtook the U.S. Embassy and held 52 Americans hostage for 444 days. So in a lot of Americans... 400? 444 days, yes. So in a lot of people's minds, that's the only flashpoint they have. Like, oh, they took our, our, our Americans hostage at the embassy. That's terrible. And then the Islamic Revolution happened. Then the... Um, the clerics came into power, so it's a theocracy now with, um, you know, the Ayatollah and the president. Um, so it's very different, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, now there's a compulsory hijab, and things are restrictive in a different way. Mm -hmm. There used to be a time earlier in Iran's history, it was almost the reverse. It was very secular. You were forbidden to wear a hijab in public, and if you were, you were beat. So, mm -hmm. um, so it kind of flipped, okay, uh, with that. But it's because of us. Right. Um, it's not the only thing, you know, uh, Iranians are certainly, there's, you know, corruption and oppression in their regime, but our sanctions, what we're doing to them, um, so they're kind of getting it from both ends, their government and us, and the sanctions and the things we've done to them for the last 40 years uh, helps to keep the hardliners in Iran in place. When the foreign minister, Javad Zarif, He's more of a moderate, a reformist. Hey, let's work with the Americans. Let's work on the Iran nuclear deal. Some of the hardliners and the more conservatives in his government are like, do not work with the West. You cannot trust Americans. Look what they did to us before. He worked with the Obama administration to come up with the Iran nuclear deal, which, again, they were very optimistic about, many of the people in Iran. And then we pulled out of it. So see, now the hardliners are like, see, you can't trust the Americans. And then just what happened with the commander. You can't trust us. So that has taken our relationship back a thousand years right, right. than where it could have been after, in 2015 when the um, nuclear deal happened, again, that was a very big deal. And I would say personally probably one of the best things that Obama did as president. <laughs> he has his own problems and we won't talk about drones and stuff like that. But that was probably one of the best things that he did and Trump has really undone a lot of that. Um, you know, and that it comes back to oil, it comes back to weapons, comes back to money, mm -hmm. okay? You know, um, again, we, at, during the Iran-Iraq war, at one point we were supplying both of them, okay? We wanted to have control in the region, and okay? Um, so, and again, same thing with Saudi Arabia, comes back to money, oil, power, uh, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, Israel plays a role in this too, I didn't get into all that, but um, uh, so, but Iran, again, it's sovereign, they want their independence, 
they, you know, I forget the. Excuse me for yeah. asking, but they want their independence from who? Like they want to be independent. They don't want sanctions. They cannot freely trade with other countries because of U.S. sanctions. Um, their economy is decimated. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the real to dollar things are like super cheap there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the amount of money like you know we would make in a certain period of time, it would take them months, if not years. Uh, I remember one of the tour guides that I'm friends with talked about. Um, you know, maybe wanting to get another job in another country, maybe going to China or something like that. But he's like, Amber, it would cost me a year's salary to be able to go to China, okay? Um, you know, they're, it's just affected them in so many ways. Um, so again, what we're doing doesn't help, and, and their government can point to like, well, America, they're the bad ones. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't hurt, the sanctions are not hurting the elite, the government, it's hurting the middle class people and the poor people in Iran. And um, again, like I said, there's a lot of corruption and stuff like that. They can put a lot of the blame on, or all the blame on the United States. The government can um, kind of deflecting from that. Um, um, so that's our role in it. Uh, whatever democracy, or sorry, whatever government or regime or whatever they want, that's up for them to decide, not for us to go in. You know, Trump talks about regime change and, and eggs on, oh yes, please, we're, we support the protesters, we support this and that. Okay, but you, you don't support um, Iranians being able to travel here. Um, you have all these sanctions, he's imposed more sanctions, you know, since the more, since the more recent events. Um, this does not help them. Okay, you're not really supporting them. You talk about re regime change, but do you really care? You don't really care about the people, and it's really up to them if they want to change their government. But we can do, the only thing we can really do is impact our government and our relationship to Iran and that whole region. And a, a, war, a war with Iran would be disastrous, mm -hmm. <laughs> not just for us, but for them right. um, as well. Mm -hmm. so. And nationalized oil means to, they wanted to create like their own quote-unquote VP or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they want yeah. they want to be in control of the oil and reap the benefits, but mm -hmm. Britain had come in and really was taking most of the profits. Mm -hmm. And they're like, hey, this is on our soil, what right. are you doing? Right. They kicked them out, and then Britain didn't like that, got so involved overthrew their government, so that way this Shah that came in that was, um, again, had our interests in mind. Right, right. Yeah, so. those business relationships are, you see that pattern throughout the world, like yeah. especially in the 50s and that Cold War period, like in Latin America and Guatemala with like the food industry. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a consistent pattern. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? I think maybe a cold team. Could you want to get more involved in that? Yeah. I'm able to. I might see you on Saturday. Oh, great. And this, oh, sorry, this is the book I recommend. It's called All the Shah's Men, An American Coup and the Roots of Middle East Terror, written by Stephen Kinsey. Very good background from 1953 up to the revolution, 1979. Um, this is another good book written by Medea Benjamin, the co-founder of Code Pink. This is a super quick read, like a quick primer. Right. Um, I was, um, it's called Inside Iran, The Real History and Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran. I didn't mention this one earlier, but people usually like to bring up women's rights and what about what about the women? Yeah. You know, we care about the women, but when we're dropping bombs, we don't care about the women right. and the children. Right. Right. This is a really, I actually haven't started to read this book yet, but it was recommended to me. Uh -huh. uh, do Muslim women need saving? Okay, uh, so <laughs> uh, I wanna read this. Uh, I think it will answer some of those questions. Technically in Islam, women, it's their free choice if they want to wear hijab or whatever. Some governments like Iran or like Saudi Arabia will force women to wear the hijab, but the religion itself does not force that. Right. It's the woman's choice. A lot of people don't realize that. And I think some of that ties into the Western, our version of feminism that right. we try to push on to other places. Exactly. And that's not their version of feminism. Exactly. Yeah. And you can totally be a feminist and wear yeah. a hijab. Yeah. And right. what about Mo Mother Teresa? No one says Mother Teresa's, um, uh, I'm sorry, not Mother Teresa, um, uh, our nuns are oppressed right. because they're, you know, covering their head. Right. In, in, you know, religious Jewish communities, women cover their head. Right. We would never say they're oppressed, right? Right. right. Or maybe some people would. I don't know. But <laughs> I take pictures of the books. Yes, sure. Well, if you want a copy of that article, you can